overhead kick. And what a goal it was! Stewart makes it 1 1. And it is a gorgeous little chip. This could well be the moment. Yeah. It is the moment. Hello and welcome to Kickoff, the official podcast of NPL New South Wales and Football New South Wales League's competitions. My name is Teo Pelizzeri and I'm joined by commentator, journalist and all-around expert on all things New South Wales football, Nicola Posda. Nicola, great to have you in the pod for this edition. Thank you, Teo. It's a pleasure to be here debuting in this fantastic podcast with yourself. Well, you say that. We had you on for the season preview, so I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts on both men's and women's football as part of today's show because we've got a number of guests coming up, uh, NPL men's and women's as well as League One men's and women's, but you are a man about not just town but about the entire state. You get out to the grounds. You are a familiar your face and uh, I'm intrigued as to some of your insights and some of your thoughts on how the season is shaking out as we get up to about the halfway point. Very interesting season it's in particular in the men's we've hit the halfway point there so uh, the title well and truly up for grabs uh, relegation spots uh, heating up and the women's well can go anyway can't it it's been a fantastic start to the NPL women's season this year. Well, speaking of the NPL women's, the transfer window shut on the 20th of May across all competitions. So we will expect to see up to 70 new faces from the A-League women's competition. The NPL men's transfer window is going to open just around the corner. We'll revisit that soon. But uh, Nicola, off the top, uh, we've got some promotions to get to and then we'll get into our moment of the month. So... All NPL New South Wales matches and League One match of the rounds are broadcast live, free and on demand via YouTube in 2024. You've been out commentating all around the venues. How have you found the experience of going back to YouTube this It's been fantastic. I think it's very accessible for people. I think people have enjoyed it as well. Uh, and the coverage, as always, has been fantastic. So kudos to Football New South Wales and, of course, all the players and that make it possible. And as we record today's podcast, we are celebrating National Volunteer Week across the Football New South Wales community. A special shout out to all the volunteers at all levels of the game who play such a big part in ensuring clubs can operate effectively every week. And you, as someone who's probably done the equivalent of uh, full-time work uh, at a club for not very much in return, sometimes zero, uh, other than the satisfaction of a job well done, how important is it that we celebrate and acknowledge the volunteers? Absolutely. I think the football community Community is so, is so tight knit, and every single person that gives up their time and spends time trying to make the game better, make the game grow, it's the, the game wouldn't be able to to run without volunteers. So they're incredibly important to football. Let's get in to our moments of the last month. Now, since uh, this podcast last reconvened, plenty of twists and turns on the ladders in both competitions. So I'll let you go first, Nicola. What has been, in NPL men's, your moment of the last month? Well, I'm going to have to go with two, Teo, because it was very difficult for me to, to split them. And, and they're, they're both individual performances. The first has to be Travis Major. Uh, we know him as a lethal goal scorer, terrorising the opposition defence and goalkeepers throughout the years. But he lined up as a centre-back, believe it or not, a couple of weeks ago, and he was... Phenomenal, a la Nemanja Vidic um, in his heyday against Marconi. And he didn't look out of place one bit. So I know a lot of people wouldn't have expected that, but Travis Major is a centre-back. So well done to Mark Crittenden for um, for trying that one out. Was that break glass in case of emergency or do you think we'll see it again? I, I mean, I mean, the transfer window is about to open, so I doubt we're going to see it again. Well, I don't think Travis will allow that to happen again, but he, he took one for the team and did a fantastic job. Um, my, my second one, and I'm sure everyone's seen it, but Ten Qual. Um, I hope you've seen it, Teo. Two weeks in a row, absolute ferocious free kicks. They were struck so well. There was so much power and precision behind it. I, I was almost speechless, aside from my screaming on Friday night after commentating the goal. It was um, it was something special and one that I think has gone worldwide too, thanks to his brother. Yeah, and uh, some sensational highlights. I've got to say... On a similar theme, even though Ten Qual is not near the top of the golden boot, my highlight of the last month is just how close we have seen the golden boot become. The baker, the reigning gold medalist, Alec Ruszewski, you know, he's still clear. He's on top at the time of recording, a couple ahead of Ben Gibson, but the chasing pack 
is starting to all make their move. Some of the goals Takumi Afuka has scored for Wollongong this season have been outrageous, and yet he's six behind the baker. Jack O'Brien seems to pop up and score every week for Blacktown City, and yet he is three behind the baker. Nathaniel Blair... Unfortunately, I expect that his time playing every week, week in, week out for Wanderers, might be about to wrap up with the A-League off-season, but we'll wait and see. Ben Gibson at Arpia, they're going to be relying on him to keep scoring. But I don't know. Uh, Roy O'Donovan can still find the back of the net, and uh, Adam Bagaria, maybe he's in the same boat as Nathaniel Blair, but I am loving the Golden Boot race. You know who's probably not? A guest of this show, James Temelkovsky's only got seven for the season. He said on this podcast he wanted 30. He's got to make his move. What, do you make, what have you made of the Golden Boot race uh, and, and the twists and turns it's made? Well, I've, I've watched JT a couple of occasions now commentating on Marconi's games this year. And I think he scored in almost every game except the last one I did because he got sent off there. So no goals for him there against Blacktown. But he has struggled with a bit of injury. He's suspended at the moment. So that's probably set him back from his target of 30. But in general, it's just... Incredible. Look at the experienced Roy O'Donovan still scoring goals. Could have had a couple on uh, Friday night, but you have to be happy with the one. But it's been it's been fantastic and so many goals. Let's get to your NPL New South Wales women's moment of the last month. What stands out to you there? Well, look, I think we're going to get to it more throughout this pod, but obviously the amount of A-League women's players coming down into the competition uh, is has just lifted the level that was already at a decent decent level but it's just gone up another notch now and um it's, it's already been noticed in the last few weeks it, it's been fantastic in the year i think for for me the moment is how tight the top of the table is and manly united they've been they've been fantastic so far bit of a slip up in the last couple of weeks but they've been great so now i'm, I'm banning you from doing any predictions because pre-season i i think that uh you know yours and henley's predictions still uh, the jury is still out on those i'm gonna plant my flag in the ground right here and no disrespect to these two clubs, because it's not just teams, it's clubs. I think we're down to a two-team race to avoid relegation between the Blacktown Spartans and the University of New South Wales. But it's two real contrasts in terms of where they're picking up their points. The club championship, where only last place gets relegated, University of New South Wales have a few more points than Blacktown Spartans at the moment. Spartans are making some big moves to try and bring in some A-League talent, maybe just get that little sugar hit and a few points in the bank to try and avoid relegation. But at the time of recording, there's a big gap between 10th and 11th and a big gap between sort of Sydney Uni, Spirit, Bulls Academy, and then Spartans and University of New South Wales in the bottom two. So uh, I'm I'm just flagging that we had relegation go down right to the final day of the season in seniors' last campaign, and Spartans pulled off the great escape with that win away to Manly. I think they might have to go to the well and do it all over again. Yeah, it's going to be very tight all up until the last round, and I do believe that some other clubs, as the, even though the, the gap is quite vast at the moment, I think it can close very quickly. So they'll have to be, the teams above Bulls, Spirit and Sydney Uni will need to be careful. But at the moment, Blacktown and Uni, they've got a bit of work to do. Let's get into our guests. You're listening to Kick Off, the official podcast of NPL New South Wales and Football New South Wales League competitions. So it's time to speak to our first guest and we are going right up to the top of the table in NPL Men's New South Wales because this club and this team has grabbed all the headlines, spectacular goals, wild score lines and until the weekend just gone, they were the pace setter. Now they find themselves in a real ding-dong battle for the title this season is the Western Sydney Wanderers and we are speaking to one of their star men, Zach Sapsford. Zach, thanks for joining us on Kickoff. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, great to be here. Let's just start with uh, where the team is at and the performances this season because pre-season, were you expecting to win 11 of your first 15 and at the halfway point of the season be contending for the title? Was it something that the NPL boys as a group had even thought was possible given that you were at the other end of the ladder last season? Um, I think regardless of where we were last season, uh, I hope most teams, including ourselves, always have a goal to be in and around the top finals, uh, pushing to win the premiership. So yeah, I think we did, maybe it's a bit unexpected for everyone else, but we definitely expected ourselves to be in and around that fight for the premiership. So it's not super surprising. And I think we got the squad to do it. So, yeah. 
And Zach, t- tell us about the quality in your squad. You've, you've touched on it a little bit there. Marcus Yunus, Alex Badolato, Nathaniel Blair, Aiden Hammond, all players that have been there or thereabouts with the A-League team. So tell us, tell us about the, the quality you guys have in the team. Oh, our, uh, our quality is uh, top tier. I think those players you mentioned, but then there's other boys even. you got players like Riley Hollingdale, Adam Bagaria, um some younger boys as well stepping up. I think they've really shown themselves this year, having a really good season in MPL, and that quality is shown in the performances and also goals or not conceding as many. Um, but no, I think our quality is really, really good this year and uh, working well as a team, and I think the results have shown that. What's been the thing that's brought the group together, though? Because it, every A-League academy has an assembly of very talented players, but is it on-field leadership? Is it certain personalities within the team? Is it the way you've been coached? What what has been sort of the, the secret ingredient to turn your very talented group into a team that gets winning results on the weekend? Uh, well, the simple answer is our coach. I think Christo is a top coach and he's really good at getting us all to work together. But on that as well, I think the boys involved in the uh, in the squad is really willing to be a team and not just a bunch of individuals on the pitch because you can get caught up on that very quickly as players that are, you know, going in between A-League and MPL. And I think the boys that have dropped down have done really well in keeping themselves grounded and understanding that MPL is a very, very good level for players uh, as young as us. Um, and, yeah, boys, the ones you mentioned, I think they've shown this year uh, they can do a real, real good job in MPL and hopefully we continue that way. So the MPL has obviously been a, a good stepping stone for, for a lot of the young boys to step into the A-League scene. How will that change as the season moves on? Obviously, we know that a lot of the boys tend to drop off during um, the transfer window. How's that going to affect Western Sydney and yourself as well, of course? Uh, To be honest, I don't have an answer for that right now, but I hope we play as many games as we can because playing football is obviously important for any young player, regardless of what level it is. Just getting those minutes in because you can't really uh, get that in just training. Let's say you're just training with the A-League squad, you need to be playing games, and that's the important thing, because then you get your game wa- game awareness. Um, you just got to have that, because then when you have that time to step into an A-League team, um, for example, the Wanderers, you've got that ability to just transfer that game awareness straight into the A-League, so it's not just you're fresh off training instead of you know, playing eight to ten MPL games in a row. That's really good for a young boy. You, you, you're so um, sort of humble and measured in how you talk about going between the two levels, though, because how are you able to sort of regulate your emotions? You've got the high of scoring in a Sydney derby, starring on an A-League stage in you know, arguably its biggest game other than the grand final, and then you've got to have the humility to go back and play in the NPL week in, week out, grind away, keep working. How is that something that has always been easy for you, or is it actually something that you've had to make adjustments to realising that the exhilarating highs aren't going to always be there for you, even after you tick off new achievements in your career? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I think for me personally, I don't... Uh, I know where I've come from, so I've played MPL2 for Hakoa, uh, even in the under-20s. So I came back from England to Australia, and that's my first you know, few games was under-20s in MPL2. So I know there's, it's not always these big highs of, as you said, scoring in the derby. And I think it's an individual decision to you know, look at it not as a, a step down uh, to play in the MPL, but it's just it's good for you as a player to learn how to deal with those games that maybe in everyone else's mind, it's not as important, but everyone's always watching. If you're, if you're not on your game, every game, you're going to get looked at in the wrong way. So you want to make sure 
that an MPL game for you is almost as important as a Sydney derby to perform, to keep those levels as high as you can. Very humble, Zach, but I remember you as a, when you first broke onto the scene in, in New South Wales with Hakoa, um, from the moment I, I saw you on the pitch, I knew that there was something special there. And talk us through how you've progressed through your football career as well. Obviously, Hakoa was a massive stepping stone for you, moving on to the A-League and then with Sydney FC and, and now at Western Sydney. So to tell us about that progress and how you've moved through and even important people throughout that period for yourself? Uh, yeah, no, I think it was a great stepping stone Hakoa to start off with. And I think the coach there really put trust in me, Luca Hajina. He was really good to me. And I think as a young, a really young kid, I thought to play in the first grade team at any level was important for me. And thankfully he gave me that opportunity. And obviously I did well enough to spark some interest from Sydney FC. And yeah, I took that. And then I went on to play with their MPL team, which we obviously had a great first 11 or 12 games when I was there. And I was just happy to be a part of it. And I think that season for me was my most important season to get myself an A-League contract with the Wanderers. And moving on from there, I think I uh, played a bit with the MPL team as soon as I got there. And then we got promoted to MPL 1 and I really enjoyed that. And then, you know, having a few games that season in the A-League, playing a lot of M MPL, really, you know, you learn a lot from those experiences maybe thinking you should play a bit more in the A-League, but nothing ever just happens the way you think it should. So it was a good uh, learning curve for me. Um, even just having a whole season of training in an A-League setup was very important for, for me to learn how everything works, you know, how coaches deal with certain situations, how you need to deal with a certain situation, whether that's, you know, you're in the squad one week and then next week you get on the squad and you got to go down and play MPL again. So I think that was a good year for me learning wise. And then this season, uh, I think it's been a better season, uh, A-League and MPL combined. So I think we've done really well so far, but we can obviously get better. Fantastic insight. And I think that'll help a lot of youngsters that, you know, prob potentially get caught in the same sort of, issues I guess as you where they're mixed between the A-League and the MPL so it's always good for youngsters to, to hear these sort of stuff but a bit of a 60 second Q&A now for you Mr Sapsford are you ready for this? Yep. Alright let's go what is your first football memory? Kicking a ball with my dad Beautiful. at a random park uh, Favourite footballer of all time? Thierry Henry Day or night matches? Night. Best footballer you've played with? That's a big one. Morgan Schneiderlin. Favourite post-game food indulgence? Probably McDonald's. <laughs> okay, you got to tell us, what's the order then? My order? Probably a quarter pounder meal. <laughs> there we go, food of champions. All right. Go to karaoke song. Uh... Fly Me to the Moon's Frank Sinatra. Wow, okay. Interesting. Dream Stadium to play in? Emirates. Okay, not bad. Well, I mean, he said Thierry Henry, so of course it's yeah. going to be Arsenal, of course. Okay. Yeah. He could have said Highbury, you know, but he probably wasn't even important for Highbury. No, <laughs> I wasn't. Biggest football ick? Football ick. What, what's, something, what's, what's something that, you know, in football... That just puts you off. It can be, you know, people that wear the tiny shin guards or play with their shirt tucked in, or what's something that when you see it on, on from a teammate or on the football pitch, you just shake your head in disgust. The guys that cut their socks at the back. Oh, okay. I like that. A lot of people love cutting their socks, but yeah, Zach Sapsford uh, likes the integrity of the socks. He's yeah. talking about the ones at the back, you know, for the boys with the big calves that need yeah. the extra space. Yeah, I agree yeah. with you, there, Zach. I'm with you, mate. <laughs> MPL team, this is a tough one, that you most want to beat this season. 
You beat him most oh. of the competition already, but moving on in the second half. Probably Sydney United. Oh, okay. Um, so thank you for doing the quick Q and A. One last one to get you out of here, and let's just let's just test um how well the media team at Wanderers have been uh, doing the media training with you, mate. Um, how do you think the dynamics going to change with a new A League coach coming in now that Mark Rodan has moved? That's a great question. That's why we left it till last. But I just want to, we we you know get all the media training, uh, all the lessons you've learned, and give us a nice straight bat on this one. I think it depends who it is, but. I hope for me that the coach will play youngsters and have trust in the youngsters. But on that as well, I think Wanderers as a club, we all know that we need to be competing every year. As a club this big, we need to be competing with the top teams, you know, consistently in finals. And whoever comes in, hopefully, can integrate a winning style of football and with that, as I said, hopefully play as many youngsters as possible because I think, as everyone can see in the NPL this season, we've proven, and even in the A-League, we've done a great job playing when we've been given the chance. So, yeah. Well, Zach, you and your teammates have been some of the great entertainers of the NPL season so far. Keep up the great goals, the uh, the fantastic team moves and the spectacular strikes uh, across the board, mate, whether it's yourself or Aidan Hammond or Bagaria or, of course, uh, Nathaniel Blair leading the Golden Boot. We've loved it so far. Good luck for the second half of the season, both personally and as a team with the Wanderers. And thanks for joining us on Kickoff. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks for having me. Once again, a big thanks to Zach Sapsford from the Western Sydney Wanderers. All right, it's time to switch focus to NPL Women's New South Wales with our guest for this episode. Day after day, Kappa rewrites the concept of sportswear. Kappa means teamwork, past, present, and future. Kappa never stops, because winning starts within. Two people, one brand. Kappa. All right, now on kickoff, it's time to talk about NPL Women's New South Wales and a team that has grabbed plenty of attention this season because of both their results and the way they've played has been the Gladesville Ravens. And we are joined by Kim Davey from the Ravens. Kim, thanks for jumping on kickoff. No worries. Thanks for inviting me. So second season for the Ravens up in the top flight, established after getting promoted last season and doing such a great job. As we near the halfway mark of the current season, where do you assess the Ravens as being at? I think we're in a really, yeah, really good position, both how we're playing structurally and, and the people that we've added um, into the team, and then also on the table. I think we're fifth at the moment, which is a great, uh, great position to be. Yeah, halfway through the season, like you said. Kim, you, you guys really have stepped it up this year. Like last year, you were good as well. There was a bit of a dip in form toward the end of the season, but this year really right up there for the semi-finals positions. Can the club push on? And is that the plan? In particular with the players you guys have brought in, uh, there's a lot of quality there. So I'm, I'm guessing that finals football is on the agenda? Yeah, definitely. I think last year the, the goal was to kind of just consolidate our position in MPL 1, but definitely the focus for this year is to make semi-finals. And so, yeah, we've brought some really great players in. Um, and I think we're in a really good position to, to make finals um, for this year. One thing that fascinates us uh, about the NPL Women's and just today as we're recording, Football New South Wales has published a list of more than 50 players that are returning from the A-League Women's to the NPL level. But I get the impression from Gladesville that you have built a team that is there to last for the entire season. You're not going to be borrowing or bringing in any players for short sugar hits. Was that something that the club consciously set out to do with your squad construction? Or is it just the machinations of how player movement has come and gone uh, this particular season? Yeah, I probably can't really talk too much on that, to be honest, because it's more of our technical director and our coach that kind of sets up the, well, I guess, selects the players for the for the year. But yeah, like you said, we've brought in some really quality kind of ex a league players, so they're not playing at the moment. Uh, but they have played in the past, so they're kind of at that standard anyway. So I think we've got at least five people that have played A-League games before. Um, so, yeah, whether you bring new A-League players in or you get old A-League players, they're still kind of at that level, right? So, um, yeah, I think we do. Might, we might have one 
A-League player coming in that I, that I heard just sign the other day. I'm not sure if I can mention who it is yet. Oh, no, you, you definitely can. It's Deborah and Della Harp. So um, that's that's out there. Unless you've got... Uh, you do have some more breaking news for us. I think there might be someone else, but I, I, I'll i just... I'll uh, leave that one um, to, to the Glazeville Ravens marketing team to let everyone know. Now, uh, with regards to some of those names you mentioned, though, and some of your teammates, one, one player who... Um, broke onto the scene sort of as a very young teenager and has really had to find her feet and refind her love for the game is Lexi Moreno. And some of the goals she scored this season, long-range goals, free kicks, what has her season been like and what's it been like being her teammate and watching her really refind her best? Yeah, I mean, Lexi's always been like a quality player. I think you saw last year as well. Um, I think she just needed some, probably some confidence. Um, and she's definitely found that this year and she's playing unbelievably. I think she told me yesterday she's got four team of the weeks out of a possible 12. So I think that's that's pretty good. Um, not 50%, but that, yeah, it's up there. So, yeah, it's great playing with Lexi. She moves the ball well. I think she's a lot fitter than she has been in the past as well, which is excellent. Um, and, yeah, I'm hoping that she can start playing 90 minutes again and keep scoring goals. Well, Kim, talking about Team of the Week, you made the Team of the Week this week yourself. You had a fantastic game against Sydney Olympic. You, well, you shut Sydney Olympic out for about 88 minutes of the game and yeah. then Demi Kulazakis scored an absolute spectacular goal. But tell us about yourself and your own performances. Obviously, you're, you're the captain of this side You on the weekend. It was obvious to me that you know, you're know you a major part of this team. Tell us about yourself and, and Romina as well. She obviously plays a massive part too, but... How is that, you guys, being the leaders of this squad? Yeah, thanks for that. Um, I think, uh, personally, I'm a lot fitter than I was previous year. So uh, we've got a new strength and conditioning coach and a new physio, and they did an awesome preseason um, kind of schedule or workout. Um, and then we've kind of just flowed that in and as well with the new coach that we've got, G. He's, he's amazing tactically. He sets us up every week. He gives us the confidence to play football. I think that we haven't had that in the past. So... Um, yeah, I think on the back of that, like, I've been stepping up and, and uh, did you say Romina as well? Yeah, I, I feel like yeah. Romina's really been a uh, linchpin in that squad and you can see her leadership qualities like your, yourself as well. Yeah, I think she's been um, amazing as well. Like, she's a, she's a very um, technical goalkeeper and she's got a lot of experience and she, I think every year feels more and more confident to kind of, um, yeah, pass that on to, to everyone in front of her and then me as well, I think, um, yeah, just with more more, more games and um, quality players in front of me. I'm able to organise everyone. And we definitely defend from the front, though. I think, like, we've got a solid back line, but we defend from our front. The front. Like, our strikers do an amazing job, and I think that's why um, we've been so competitive um, this year. And how about the obje- objectives for the Ravens this year? We, we spoke about finals football, but a run in the Sapphire Cup, how good would that be for the club and the pro- promotion of the football club as well? Yeah, definitely. Like semi-finals is definitely our number one goal, and then number two would be making the final of the Sapphire Cup. I think we got to the semi-final last year um, and got beaten by the Northern Tigers. But yeah, the, the goal is to get to the final of Sapphire Cup this year, um, and uh, we're on track. First game done and dusted, so we'll see who we play in the next round. Now, I have to ask, uh, a lot of clubs, both men's and women's, have a fine system when someone appears in the media, when they talk to the media, when their photo appears in like a local newspaper or something like that. Do you have something similar at the Gladesville Ravens? Do you know what? We, we don't. Because there's a reason I ask, and I, I think I know the reason you don't. It's because Dan Ullman, who is a brilliant photographer, is down there at the Ravens so often, I think you'd all be broke. I mean, I've seen, I've seen more photos of the Gladesville Ravens this season than any other team. Who's, who's like the worst offender for just posting photos on Instagram or, or making sure that everyone knows that they're an NPL footballer and you know, make sure to get the badge in and that sort of thing? It definitely, it definitely would be Ramira Parigire. Not, she not, not Cheryl Lumbus. Oh, maybe up there, but I reckon Ron likes photos more than anyone. So I think she's always on the phone to Dan, getting, getting him to come down and um, take photos of our games. That's probably why he's there so often. If you tried to bring in a fine system, how quickly do you think you'd be overthrown? Oh, I don't know. I think people would get around it. It's definitely <laughs> made by multiple people, so... It's just a bit of admin that I'm not really a fan of, so 
if I can get someone else to do it, maybe maybe we can um, set it up. Uh, you've been you've been warned, uh, Gladesville players potentially. Um, uh, Nicola's going to uh, fly in to our fastest minute, sixty seconds Q and A. First answer that comes to mind, please, Kim. Uh, Nicola, is it one word or sentence? Ah, uh, it's it, entirely up to you. Just whatever comes to mind, Nicola. Take it away. Sounds good. So, Kim, what is your first ever football memory? Um, I don't know about my first, but the best one is scoring scoring eight goals in one game. That's not that was a bad pretty. One. Cool. Your favorite footballer of all time. Oh, I really like Steph Catley. I think she's awesome. I, I used to play wing back, and yeah, I just tried to do everything that she did. Day or night matches? Ooh, I would say night. Best footballer that you've ever played with? Uh, Nat Tobin. Favourite post-game food indulgence? And I'm really interested in this because I know what mine is. Post-game? Oh, I love Chinese food. Go to karaoke song. Ooh, uh, it's called Tusa. It's like a bit of Spanish and a bit of um, English by um, Carol G and Nicki Minaj. Very nice. Dream stadium to play in. Oh, I really like Combank. I love the light show. Nice. Well, we'll have a chat to football news stars about maybe moving the grand final. Yeah, or the we'll <laughs> final. That's yep, right. we'll see. Oh, well, yeah. that'd be cool. Uh, biggest football ick. Biggest football ick? Pro when people roll their shorts. I don't get it. <laughs> we always get great we always get great answers to this question. Uh, br- bring us home, Nicola. And the MPL team that you most want to defeat this season. I reckon I have an idea who, but let's see what you say. Oh, it was Apia. We already beat them. <laughs> I had a feeling oh, that was going to be your answer. Maybe Northern Tigers, because they smashed us in the Sapphire Cup and that still burns. Well, Kim, we appreciate the insights into how things are going at the Gladesville Ravens. Obviously, um, you, know, you yourself uh, are taking a big role in driving this team up the table. And we wish you all the best in that pursuit of a final spot and also the Sapphire Cup in the second half of the season. Thanks for having a word to us on kickoff. No worries. Thanks for the invite. See you later. And that is us done in the top flight, at least for now. Stick around. We'll have a bit more of a chat about the state of the season. But now we're going to turn to our league's focus and start with the men's competition. Every NPL New South Wales match, live, free and on demand on YouTube. Subscribe to the Football New South Wales YouTube channel today. It's time to turn to the leagues and part of our league focus here on kickoff includes League One Men's, which is always a hotly contested league and the title race is no different this season. We are joined by Tom Whiteside from the Mount Druitt Town Rangers. He wears many hats in football, but we speak to him in his Mount Druitt Town player guys today. Tom, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Now, you are uh, really a man with, uh, I don't know how to describe it, feet in many camps or fingers in many pies in football. Um, but as we talked to you as a, a Mount Druitt Town Rangers player, how is your season going in that respect? Uh, yeah, it's started really well. I mean, halfway through the season and top of the table by one point, you uh, couldn't have asked for a better start. Um, the the boys have been uh, been really good so far. We're building a good culture, uh, getting wins, which always helps, and hopefully continue that for the rest of the season. Uh, Tom, this year there's been a lot of tight results for you guys, a lot of one-goal victories um, and a lot, of, a lot of late victories as well. Yeah. Tell, tell us about how that, you know, that's obviously down to the, the team and the way they, the character they have. So talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, no, the uh, the boys have, uh, have sort of really turned it around, especially from the last couple of years where, uh, you know, those sort of tight games that Mount Druitt might have only got away with a draw or maybe lost and there has been a real mentality shift at the club and uh i guess a little bit more sort of work ethic and never give up never say die and it's just uh instilling those sort of uh those sort of principles into the team and yeah when it's when it's tight when it's tough it's just you know reminding the boys just keep going just keep going keep fighting we will get one more chance it's just a matter of if we're good enough to take it and i guess football gods have been on our side a little bit where we have taken those chances and yeah come away with vital three points here and there and we know momentum in football is a big thing and you know once we got 
one or two of those late victories. We feel like now, any time it's late in games and it's still a draw, we have that belief that we can still go on to win it. Only a couple defeats this year, but that one a couple of weeks ago really, really sticks out. The seven-one defeat to the Bulls. <laughs> what happened on that day, mate? Ah, uh, what happened on that day? We, the squad has been, had been struggling a little bit with injuries and illness and suspensions, and it was more of a case of I just don't think that we were ready to play that game. Uh, I know it was a top of the table clash and a, and a huge game in terms of uh, the how the season could pan out. But uh, I think mentally we were going into the game with a wrong mindset and it showed in the result. It's fascinating to hear you speak about sort of the mindset and the, the culture within the group because Mount Druid Town in the top flight had been battling against the drop, you know, a lucky escape one year or a, you know, a, a tight escape one year and then going down in the playoff at the end of last season. I mean, did you walk into an environment that felt ready for a reset or had it already started taking place when you arrived? It was a bit of both. I think uh, the board had definitely recognised that there needed to be a shift and there needed to be, uh, I guess, certain people moved on and different people brought in. Um, And speaking with Andy, the coach, in the off-season, you know, he he was big on trying to rebuild the culture. And uh, I guess that's sort of why he wanted to bring me in as well, to try and help steer that ship. And speaking to him, we both had very similar principles in how we wanted to, to move the club from, you know, they did have a bit of a reputation of, you know, Mount Druitt, always at the bottom of the table, always struggling for, uh, you know, for survival and whatnot. And to try and turn that has been, you know, it's super proud of, of the boys and the club of how we have turned that around and how we now have this winning mentality and never say die attitude. Where again, last year, that those results wouldn't have happened. But this year, it, it is starting to happen. So, yeah, no, it's a, it is a massive credit to, to the club and to Andy and, and the boys for turning it around. Given your own coaching credentials, what's what's the difference between a captain's armband and your coaching hat? Or is it is it one and the same and, and you do see yourself as something of an on-field coach? Uh, I, I do see myself as more of an on-field coach. Um, if, I mean, I'm sure that you've heard me play where I am non-stop talking and trying to organise and... And I guess that sort of just feeds into into coaching at the same time. So, yeah, I know I, I do have, you know, the coach's hat and then the captain's hat, but there isn't a lot of difference between it. It's still trying to get everyone swimming in the right direction, I mean, trying you, to get everyone. Yep. Given you are still only in your 20s, I mean, is, is are you the sort of player that can see yourself playing well into your 30s or have you set yourself a, a limit or has your, your body sent you any messages on how many years as a player you will stay a player before you turn your focus to, to coaching or is it just something that you'll play as long as the body lets you? Uh, the, the body is, uh, is definitely having a few chats with the mind at the moment about playing, <laughs> definitely. But um, look, it's... It is something that I am thinking about. I'm not, uh, I'm not sure when that time will come. Only time will tell. Uh, all I know is that you're you're a long time retired from playing. So I, I will try and play as long as I can. But it also, you know, is sort of dependent on, I guess, coaching opportunities. If there are opportunities popping up, and when that time to uh, retire from playing and move to coaching is. Time will tell. We will see. Tom, you last year you spent the season at Bonnery after a whole heap of years at Sydney Olympics, some successful years at Olympics as well. Yep. Last year at Bonnery, you guys what needed one win in your last four games and you sort of bottled it in the end there. Yep. Talk to us about that and how disappointing that was. Uh, it, it was obviously disappointing. Very disappointing. And uh, it's, it's disappointing for a club like... Bonnerig, where they are such a big club and got a huge community behind them. Um, what went wrong, I'm I'm not sure. I'm still asking questions about that to this day. 
it is, to myself um, and trying to reflect on going, what could I have done more? What should I have done more? But um, look, I don't have an answer as to what exactly went wrong. At the end of the day, we just weren't good enough in those last four games to, to get a win. And yeah, now we're, we're all hurting from it. You've touched on, well, Nicola touched on um, your time at Sydney Olympic and obviously through Sydney FC, you've got your connection to Ante Juric. But something that I think I think flies under the radar quite a bit is just how much Ante had achieved in men's football, uh, winning the NPL with Sydney Olympic and uh, his coaching there. And do you, do you feel as though as someone with a foot in both camps, you know, aspiring to coach in the men's game, already coaching in the elite side of the women's game, that it is something of a rarity that you're, you're kind of pursuing both streams concurrently? Um, yes and no, because at the end of the day, football is football, whether it's men's, women's, kids, and someone like Ante Juric, who... He's just a, a natural-born winner. You look at his playing career, he won through there. And then, obviously, transitioning to coaching, why it was quite successful with Olympic, has been very successful with Sydney FC. And, you know, to to be under his sort of guidance as not only as a player, but as an assistant coach as well, you know, is it's one of the best environments for me to learn from and seeing, you know, how he, he gets... Uh, winning cultures and still in teams and and that sort of stuff so yeah just trying to learn as much from him and yeah I think he does go under the radar a little bit and you spoke about sort of your own you know principles and beliefs about football and how that has aligned at Mount Druitt um, upon joining them I mean when when you look into the future where you want to coach where you want to play you know do you do you have a anything in mind I mean you've even mentioned juniors there is um you know something that you know interests you in coaching but is it, is it just at this point you're yet to really determine whether you see yourself as a, a men's coach, a women's coach, a, a junior coach, or wherever it may take you? Yeah, look, I, I'm still very young for my coaching career, and, and I understand that, and I sort of know exactly where I'm at and where I do want to go. But um, look, at it, for the time being, it's, it's more a case of trying to gain as much experience as I can, being in the right environments, and then, you know, I it's probably a, an answer for in five years' time when I have finished playing to go, okay, where do I really want to take my coaching? Do I take that with men? Do I take stick with women? That That's probably more the case in point. I mean, with that said, um, you didn't have a choice last year when the cameras were there for A-Leagues All Access and Ante was ill pre-game and you had to take the team talk and it just happened to be the game that the cameras were in the rooms. I mean, is, is that, I mean, are you ready for the spotlight is what I'm saying, that the scrutiny came to you a little bit unexpectedly and a little bit early? Um, look, I'm, I'm always ready ready for it. I'm always ready for the challenge. I uh, have belief in myself and my ability. Now, whatever's thrown at me, whatever the situation is, uh, and if I need to step up, then I'll do whatever it takes to step up. It's, uh, I'll definitely say that I, I am sort of ready for it if an opportunity comes, but I'm also, again, realistic of where I am and where I'm at at the moment and still trying to gain as much experience as I can. Tom, talking about experience, you didn't have a great experience in the Australia Cup prelim rounds this year. Um, you went down to Illawarra Premier League, so like Coniston FC... First off, talk to us about that game and then also give us a bit of an insight what this cup does and how it helps all the players throughout the cup. We've seen some fantastic stories. I mean, Inter Lions went so far last year. It was a great story for Football League One and how, how important is the cup for, for your team, your teammates, the young boys coming through and, and so on? Yeah, no, the I mean, the Australia Cup is, is fantastic for, for all football fans. It's, um, you know, where... Uh, where players that don't normally get get seen, they are then have an opportunity to be seen um, and you know express themselves and show Australia what what they can do. Um, and it's also good for the smaller clubs, you know, especially even Coniston who we got knocked out at. You know, they they're playing against the the K and MPL two team, but they they really lifted for that. And I've seen even games in the, the last few weeks where you know, I saw the result of 
into Lions and they played a Illawarra Premier League team. I think it was Coniston as well. And, you know, the crowd that I saw there was fantastic and at the game and the results. But you don't get that in uh, normal competitions. Um, and, yeah, no, I, I think the Australia Cup is fantastic, is good. And, yeah, I think the smaller clubs really, really thrive from it. For us, Mount Druitt, this season, yeah, it wasn't the, the results that we were wanting for, but, you know, we had an opportunity to play 16, 17-year-olds with first grade and experienced players and to help them along their journey. So in terms of looking at football pathways for, for players, you know, that it, it accelerates them as well. Uh, you know, you get 15, 16, 17-year-olds being able to compete against men, being on the park with experienced players who can help them and guide them in certain situations. It's, that's what we need more of. And final question from me. Big game for you this week. You go back to Bonnerig Sports Ground. How's that going to be marching back up Elizabeth Drive and driving into the grounds there? Uh, look, the playing at Bonnerig is... It, it's always it's always special. The uh, the crowd is they always get a big crowd. They always uh, they're always a little bit hostile. Um, you know you you need to be a certain type of uh, have the, the right mentality to play there. You know it's going to be going to be a fight. You know it's going to be tough. You know it's not going to be easy going there to get three points. But I am really looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to to the challenge. And just lastly, on uh, the second half of the season, we're about to head into the depths of winter. Most of the games have been played in, in pretty good weather. And at the moment, you know, a lot of the teams are able to play the football they probably would have planned to in, in pre-season. Now the grind to the finish line starts. It is such a marathon of a league, as you know well. What's going to be key to the staying power at the top this season? I think trying to keep... Uh, as many of our players on the park as possible with, you know, obviously injuries and suspensions and keeping that core group uh, together. And I think, you know, just trying to grind out results like we have been doing. Because sometimes the football we play isn't the prettiest, uh, but there is that winning mentality that we have. So I think trying to keep that going and get as many wins as possible leading into the final couple of rounds and see where we're at. And hopefully we still have that sniff of promotion. Well, Tom Whiteside, thanks for giving us an insight into how the season is going at Mount Druid Town Rangers and also having a chat about your journey through both football on the pitch and as a coach. Uh, all the best for the second half of the season. And, uh, well, so far so good. Congratulations on uh, turning the club around, bouncing back after relegation last year. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Once again, a big thanks to Tom Whiteside and what a great competition Football New South Wales League One men's is so far this season. Many twists and turns to come, no doubt. Up next, it's our Women's League's focus. MITRE is the official ball sponsor of NPL New South Wales and Football New South Wales League's competitions. Visit MITRE Sports Australia for all your football needs. MITRE, a different league. Let's continue our League's focus. It is time for League One Women's. Gee, this is a close league and promotion is so hard fought this season. A real cluster of teams, perhaps that top four or five, all still aiming to finish top of the pile and go up to the top flight. One player who is trying to make that happen from St George FC is Jordan Baker. And Jordan joins us on the line now. A pleasure to chat to you on kickoff. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Now, we have to disclose a bit of history here on the podcast because... Uh, Jordan, even though you are now an established senior player, back when you were a gun junior, the man sitting opposite me did an interview with you, which I understand is a bit of ancient history, Nicola. Yeah, it was, uh, Jordy broke onto the scene and I thought, hey, well, we, I think she deserves a story. I think she scored a hat-trick maybe after we, just before we did the story. So, um, yeah, always been a lethal striker as Jordan Baker. Now, do you, crucially, Jordan, do you have any recollection of it? Oh, goodness. It was a, it was a very, very long time ago. <laughs> Aged a bit in between there, but <laughs> much has happened, but yeah. Well, let's, let's, focus on, let's focus on the present because, as I mentioned, the race for promotion in League One, it, it just twists and turns 
every week. St George, your team, sitting fourth at the time of recording. But uh, do you feel as though you are very much in the conversation to finish top of the league this season? Um, yeah, look, absolutely. I think it's always tough coming in the season after you, you win the league. Um, and as you said, it's such a tough competition this year. You, every game that we walk into is a fight. We're not taking anything for granted. So um, I definitely think we have it in us to, to get to the top of the league. But uh, just one game at a time for us at the moment. Well, like I said, you were always a lethal striker. Only seven goals this year, but Jordan, what's going on? We expect you to hit the net a bit more than that. Oh, you know, it's a bit of a slow start this year, but <laughs> I'm getting older. It's a bit harder to move around the pitch, but there's still plenty of plenty of games left, so don't count me out yet. How, how do you assess the standard? Because this league, when Lena Kamis, you know, a Matilda who's just come off scoring the winning goal in the NPL 1 grand final comes down to Mount Druitt and players are going from the A-League women's straight to teams in the second tier. Um, we saw it with Princess Sabini last season. It feels as though there's a lot of ambition and a lot of competition in this second tier. We've seen how well teams that get promoted do in the top tier once they go up. Have you noticed significantly what the level is like week in week out? Oh, absolutely. Um, I came into this league probably oh, at least five or six years ago and the step up um, each year has just been incredible and even from last year to this year with, with players coming in, it's just you can see that players um, don't mind coming into PL2s just because it's um, it's just as competitive and, you know, every club's fighting to go up into that top league and, um, you know, they're drawing in those players to help them to get there. Tell us about um, the Sutherland Strikers. They've picked up Tori Tumuth and she'll be defending you at some point this season. How's that been as well for the league? Yeah, look, it's great. I've, I think the Strikers have signed about three or four W League girls, which is um, incredible. And I think it'll be really great for that team and the young girls in that team. Um, I'm looking forward to coming up to uh, and versing her um, towards the end of the year. I think it'll be a great challenge. And, you know, it just makes every team that versus teams like that better and, and learn from, from those games. So I think it's, yeah, it really helps everyone out in the league. Tell us a bit about your team and your teammates because from commentating games last season, you know, I see Angelina Manos, Taylor Svetkovsky. These were players that were playing, particularly before the A-League women's players came back in the first half of NPL 1 last season. So there's a few new faces in there, but who's sort of, you know, the, the players that are keeping your side ticking over week in, week out as you maintain this title challenge? Yeah, look, I think we have quite a strong um, squad this year. Taylor's quite a new addition, so just in the last couple of weeks, she's been brilliant in our in our last few games in the Sapphire Cup. She scored her first goal. Um, Angelina, as you said, has been really strong um, all across the field, wherever we put her. We have a uh, quite a strong spine with um, Nicole Bez at the centre. So um, I think our, our team's quite... Um, how do I put it? <laughs> quite dynamic that we can move a lot of people in different positions and I think we're just really good at working working together we don't have anyone that's sort of you know um a massive star player we work really great as a team and, and fight for everything so we're, we're coming up on a year since the women's world cup kicked off and you know, we're, we're at a point where we can actually do some landmarking on the effect it's had and the flow to grassroots and, you know, sort of be able to really assess what difference it made. I guess when you're you know, competing for three points week in, week out, not a great deal changes in that respect. But have you noticed a, a, a change in the atmosphere around your own club at St George or around women's football in general, different faces, different attitudes, and maybe a bit of that World Cup legacy filtering through to your actual footballing experience, not just whistle to whistle on the weekend but broadly across your involvement in the game um yeah definitely i think as um as you said game to game it doesn't change a hell of a lot for us especially as senior players um we've always fought for for that and um you know, to make the league better um but definitely for our juniors you can see the hype and even like the supporters you can see the hype around the game um i'm a school teacher and you can even see it at school with um with some of the boys and all of the kids actually getting into uh, women's sport. Last year, I could have asked, you know, a few of the boys, you know, who was a Matildas player, and half of them could probably only tell me Sam Kerr. Now you can actually talk to them about a, a women's game or the women's um, league in um, England, and they can actually have a conversation and tell you a bit about it, which is just 
that's how, how much you can see the game's already grown just from that World Cup. So it's been incredible just for, for everyone, really. And, and bringing it a little, a little bit back closer to home, obviously the Sapphire Cup, how important has that been for women's football in New South Wales? And obviously talk to us a little bit about your run so far this year in the Sapphire Cup. Yeah, I think it's been a great addition. It's um, it's really good for for teams like us to be able to have that opportunity to verse um, on some leagues like our club teams, and then um, that opportunity to verse the the PL one teams with, um, you know, Manly and all those top tier tier teams. So, but this year I think we're just we're not putting a hell of a lot of expectation on it. We're just trying to see how we go, and uh, we're really enjoying it so far. Our battle with institute um midweek that was a really really good test for us and um it showed us that we're really capable of of great things and we can play amazing football and beat some of the the best teams so yeah it just helps us get better and better and historically i know you're involved um you know at st george now and and you've been part of the sutherland region in the past but how does it make you feel seeing Sydney FC win the A-League women's with so many players coming from Wollongong and the South Coast. It feels as though football in that region is just absolutely in a sweet spot. And the years that you were in the A-League women's, you had, you know, Caitlin Cooper and uh, Michelle Heyman and players that had always come from that region. But it seems as though there's a real rejuvenation and it remains one of the real nurseries of women's football in particular. Yeah, so um, when I played W League, I obviously came from Stingrays. I'm a Shire junior, but <laughs> played down there for many years with uh, Caitlin Cooper and Erica Holloway, um, who else? Chloe, Danica, all of those girls. So it was really strong back then. Um, and you could see it coming through the juniors with uh, with their development. Um, and it's it's really great to see that it's actually come to fruition and you can see it even with the south coast flame team they've got some really great juniors i think we versed um oh i can't remember her name but she was in the team last year and she was an absolute star so i think she was at sydney this year yeah you can just see how 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 big it's gotten down in south coast and it's great to see it all come come together well speaking pre-recording jordan i said that you should be still playing in the top tier in new south wales because i know what a lethal striker you are talk, <laughs> talk to us a little bit about your journey and how you've you've gone from the stingrays through now to football league one tell us about that and, and how that's been for you um yeah look it's it's obviously very different the last few years uh, it, it is a different um but it's, as you said it's getting Getting closer and closer each year with um, how how good the PL1 um, and PL2 comps are. Um, I think for me, I just, you know, <laughs> getting older, the body's getting older. It doesn't quite recover as much as it used to. Um, and then I've also got my outside um, teaching life. So it's quite hard to sort of juggle the requirements of playing in one of those top tier teams um, compared to sort of down at St. George. Um, we only train train twice a week, which is really great, um, and it's you know helps our team. Um, I think I actually just really enjoy training with some of the girls that are, are still developing and helping them out. So I'm sort of on that transition into a coaching sort of role that I really love. Um, so I won't count it out ever. Uh, I moved back to a, a top tier team, but you know for now it, it's just yeah where my life's at and what I'm really enjoying. Well. Coaching as well, you, you, you need to have state-of-the-art facilities. Tell us a little bit about Barton Park and how the refurbishment has gone there and what that will, that'll do, not just for the women's game, but the men's game as well, and, and football in general for the area of, of St. George. Yeah, so we got our, we had our opening game there a few weeks ago and it was absolutely incredible, to be honest. Um, the first year I came to St. George, we played there and it looks obviously very, very different. Um, you, the field is actually playable, so <laughs> that's great. Um, so it's actually it's so good for the club because we haven't had a home ground for the last uh, two or three years. So, so to get um, Barton Park back, it's just been incredible for especially the the girls. I think it's hard for us to find a home because um, we're at Rockdale Lydon at the moment. Um, so that was really special for us um, and the club. And I know Carlo, Carlo was incredibly proud to to play there and um, have that ground back. So. Last one, um, I mentioned how tight the title race is. Southern Districts, Mount Druitt Town, Hills United, you're looking up at all of them. 
what's it going to take to reel them in and finish top of the pile? Uh, yeah, look, it's it's so tough. Um, as I said, it's every week is such a battle, and you could even see it um, in our last game when we versed Blacktown. Um, it was just such a hard game, and we've got Bankstown coming up next weekend, and then we play Mount Druitt. So it's just tough game after tough game, and I think for us, we're just focusing on one game at a time. We're not looking at you know, what happens in, in 10 rounds. We're looking at what happens on the weekend and, and playing the best football we can and just continue to improve, to be honest. Um, we just want to get better and better and better. And hopefully that um, will, will lead us to a similar spot as last year where we just just played really good football in the end of the comp. Well, Jordan, we appreciate your insights into how things are going at St George and thank you for also having a chat about where you're at on your football journey as well. Uh, thanks for your time on kickoff and all the best for the rest of the season. Thank you very much for having me. Wow, it has been such a busy pod. Four awesome guests as well. Nicola Posda, uh, as we bring it home here on kickoff, um, you'll be out and about. Um, I've got to say, sadly, I haven't been able to commentate as much NPL as I wanted this season. I mean, I, I can hardly cry about it doing A-League, but also um, uh, for those that don't know, I work at Optus Sports. So there's a lot of overnight shifts on weekends in there. Um, so, hey, keep watching your mini matches of La Liga. Next time you watch Betis or Villarreal, just remember who was cutting it together. Um, but you, you're actually out there getting out and about commentating the matches on the weekends. Where can we find you over the next couple of weeks? Well, I'm not as busy as you, Taya, but this week there's a massive game in the MPL Women's New South Wales competition. And it's the MacArthur Rams hosting up your like I'm expecting so much from that game. Both teams have strengthened considerably with A-League women's players. Um, you just look at the list of those that have returned to MacArthur and Mel Caceres, Maddie McComiskey, just to name a few. Um, and then Arpia has obviously brought back Sophie Hoban, Tash Pryor, Chiara Di Domizio. And to be honest, Paige Haywood's been a phenomenal signing the last couple of weeks for them too. So I'm expecting a fabulous game there. Make sure you tune in to listen to my beautiful vocals and enjoy some fantastic football. And uh, the next time this podcast drops, make sure that you subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. What do you think uh, some of the headlines in the top divisions of uh, men's and women's football will be maybe in four or five weeks' time next time we uh, drop another podcast? Who do, who do you think we'll be speaking about either moving up or moving down the ladder? Look, I know I wasn't too complimentary about your preseason predictions, but uh, look into that crystal ball. I'm going to give you a chance at redemption. What do you think we'll be talking about about in, uh, in about a month's time as we really hit the middle of winter in the NPL? Look, I think in, in the men's men's competition, it's so tight up the top. The, only four points separate the top five teams. If I have to pick someone to to get to that top place, I can see the Western Sydney Wanderers perhaps dropping out of the five. And I think Arpia has a little bit too much depth to, um, to the rest of the competition around them. And I can, I can definitely see them finishing first at the end of 30 rounds. On the women's side, well, I've got to say MacArthur. I think I was very wrong in my um, in my preseason prediction. Arpia hasn't got it going yet. They will, no doubt, but I believe that MacArthur will be the team that will take out the premiership. And Manly has been outstanding this season, as have the Ravens, Sydney Olympic too. These are all teams. It's so tight there as well. It can go either way. Um, but I think MacArthur will, will take the premiership in the NPL women's competition. Well, Nicola Posda, dress warm and enjoy your NPL football. Thank you, Taylor. I look forward to hearing your voice soon as well. And uh, on behalf of uh, the whole crew here at Football New South Wales, as we mentioned, li uh, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Rate us five stars while you're there. We will rejoin you very shortly as the season continues on Kickoff, the official podcast of NPL New South Wales and Football New South Wales Leagues competitions. Goodbye for now. The overhead kick, and what a goal it was! Stewart makes it 1-1. And it is a gorgeous little chip. This could well be the moment. Yeah. It is the moment!